together in shared space to watch this titan of theological scholarship and education who I am honored and privileged to call my friend. Welcome to the third annual James H. Cohn Lecture Series. My name is the Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas. I am Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union and the Bill and Judith Moyers Chair in Theology, a position once held by the late Dr. Cohn. President Serene Jones wishes that she could be here with us on this evening, welcoming you and our lecturer, but unfortunately she is ill. And so we all wish her a full and swift recovery, even as we miss her presence. We started this lecture series in honor of Dr. James H. Cohn, a, the father, as we often say, of black liberation theology and a teacher here at Union for five decades. This annual lecture will continue forth his legacy of prophetic black theological and religious thought that pricks the conscience of America and of the church. Tonight's lecturer is Dr. Jacqueline Grant, the Fuller E. Calloway Distinguished Professor of Systematic Theology at the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta, where she just shared she had been there for 40 years as a professor and some 50 years as she was as well a student there. She is a proud alum of Union. Tonight, she will deliver the lecture titled The Anti-Sexism Work of James Howe. Cohn. Before we get started and before she gives her lecture, I would also like to add that as we can read about the many things that Dr. Grant has written in her work and the know the Minty students that she has mentored, and Dr. Grant has indeed a pioneering voice and a pioneer in womanist theological thought. I might add that she is also one who is works in question knows Dr. Grant, knows that she is also an exemplar of integrity. She is, has been for me one of my uh, mentors. I have learned from Dr. Grant over the years as we both shared and grew in understanding and finding our voice as womanist scholars. And I thank Dr. Grant for helping me to find my voice. Now, before we get started as well, we will have time for question and answers at the end of the lecture. You may begin by posting your questions in the Q&A section of Zoom. So now, Without further ado, I am honored to share the screen tonight with my friend, Dr. Jacqueline Grant, and hear her reflect on our mentor, Dr. Cohn's legacy through her own work. Thank you so much. It is um, indeed good to be in the union context again. Um, not there in New York physically, but um, it is good to be joining you uh, virtually uh, as we um, seek to talk about a man who has um, made um, a, an incredible difference in my life. Now, we know that he has made an incredible difference in the lives of many. Um, and not only African Americans, uh, indeed many African Americans, but uh, others uh, as well. If you look at the list of students that he uh, brought through PhD programs, you will know that he um, brought many uh, across that uh, line. Uh, and so um, I am appreciative of him, uh, his work, uh, and uh, will forever be indebted to him for what he has done uh, for me. Interestingly, um, we don't have a whole lot of time, but um, 
I, I told the story um, just uh, a couple of months ago of um, having uh, met um, Dr. Cohn and um, the fact that, it, you know, it could it almost maybe didn't happen. Um, I told the story and I'm, I'm going to make a quick of um, when I graduated from Bennett College, Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, I had already applied to uh, ITC, Turner Theological Seminary, um, where Cecil Cohn uh, was the uh, dean, the brother of James Cohn. Uh, and I applied and had not gotten a response. And I went to spend the, spend the summer in France and with my mother and and um, I had not gotten a response. Um, when I got back from France, I nothing from ITC and I was moping around the house, got packed up. I had also been accepted to a Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis, but I really didn't want to go there. I wanted to go to ITC, Turner Seminary, um, but I didn't hear anything. And so finally my mother said, um, this Monday morning, I'm packed up and getting ready to get on a bus to go to Indianapolis. And because I'm moping around, my mother said, call IT, pick up the phone and call IT. See, now, you know, many of you will, you know, my age or maybe, you know, 10 years younger than me, maybe 15 younger than me, you know, will remember that making a long distance call on a Monday morning and any time during the day is big stuff, major thing. You don't do that. We waited until 11 o'clock at night where the phone calls were cheaper uh, to make a long distance phone call. So he, her uh, giving me permission to pick up the phone and call long distance from Georgetown, South Carolina to Atlanta, Georgia. That was big stuff. And so I picked up the phone and called um, and um, the registrar said, oh, you, you haven't heard from us. You've been accepted. And oh God, I was so happy. I went to the bus station and bought a ticket for Atlanta instead of Indianapolis. I'm, I, you know, I'm not talking anything against CTS. Uh, CTS is a great school, but I wanted to go to uh, Turner Theological Seminary to ITC where uh, Cecil Cohn was uh, the dean and I often think, no, had I not made that phone call, had my mother not um, you know, said to me, pick up the phone and make a long distance call on a Monday morning to Atlanta, Georgia, uh, what would have happened to me? Where would I have been? Uh, would I have ever met, when would I have met James Cohn? Uh, it was in the context of studying at ITC that I, uh, and studying with his brother Cecil Cohn, that I got the opportunity to meet um, uh, James Cohn, which gives me a good entree to the talk that I'm going to um, give you uh, today, uh, because it was at the uh, Turner Seminary uh, when I had invited Cohn, James Cohn, to come and do a lecture uh, at a conference. And then uh, before he left, he um, took me to lunch uh, because I had already been accepted into the PhD program to study with him. And so he took me to lunch in order to tell me what to expect, talk about what to expect uh, while his PhD student at Union Theological Seminary. And one of the things he sent, said to me, one of, one of the major things that he said uh, to me is he looked at uh, me and it straight in my eyes and said, Jackie, we don't need another Jim Cohn. We do not need another Jim Cohn. And I said, oh, yes, sir. <laughs> I didn't, um, you know, know all of what he meant by that uh, at that time, uh, but he said it to me, and I remembered it uh, as I left Atlanta in the fall, headed for New York for um, to study uh, theology with uh, James Cohn. And the story is longer than that, but I don't have time to tell the the, the story in its entirety. Uh, but I wanted to focus on the fact that it was in that context that I almost missed. You know, I'm sure I would have had good education at CTS, but, you know, would I have had the opportunity to meet James Cohn and would I have been able to do what I have done had I not met James Cohn? And I will talk about a couple of things that um, my meeting him uh, resulted in. Um, in the in the last uh, four or five uh, four decades uh, after being his student, uh, being his um, uh, mentee, um, and later becoming then his uh, uh, colleague uh, and peer in the uh, teaching of uh, theology, the anti-sexism work of James 
how Cone, uh, Cone has been criticized by many. Uh, Cone and, uh, and other um, theologians, uh, black theologians um, who articulated black theology, black theology of liberation. Um, but being the father of black theology, Cone, the father of black the uh, theology, he indeed um, uh, bore a lot of criticism from a variety of places. And one of the areas uh, in which he was uh, criticizing was uh, the fact that uh, he was not able to do a theology that was inclusive, um, not only of black men, but also of black women. Um, and so I'm going to give just a few of um, the, um, the criticisms that um, have come uh, that came his way uh, during the course of um, you know, the last uh, four, uh, five um, decades as he um, was uh, doing his work as a professional uh, theologian. Rosemary Ruther uh, makes the point that Black theology was um, sexist. Um, and he, she argued that it was elitist uh, and did not uh, you know, impact um, the masses of uh, of black people, uh, and, and 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 she did this in 1974 in an article called "Black Theology and versus Feminist Theology." Teresa Hoover, in her article "Black uh, Women and uh, the Churches," um, triple jeopardy, uh, talked about uh, also published in 1974, uh, talked about the problems that black women faced uh, in uh, in the churches and. Of course, um, uh, black theology was not effectively dealing uh, with the status, changes in status of uh, women in the churches, black women in particular, women in general, but black women uh, in uh, a particular. Then later in 1978, Paula uh, Murray uh, talked about uh, black theology uh, versus um, uh, feminist theology and uh, the challenges that uh, came uh, um, you know the way of um, of um, black uh, uh, black women uh, in uh, particular, and then in 1979, um, I uh, wrote the article "Black Theology and the Black Woman," uh, which was um, published in um, the first volume of Black Theology: A Documentary History, uh, uh, edited by James Cone and um, Gayrod Wilmore. Um, and I, I, I want to share a, a part of um, uh, what I wrote back there in 1979 uh, at the end of this article in a section called uh, A Challenge to Black Theology. My central uh, argument is this, Black theology cannot continue to treat Black women as if they were invisible invisible creatures who are on the outside looking into the Black experience, looking into the Black church and the Black theological enterprise. It will have to deal with the community of believers in all aspects as integral parts of the whole community. Black theology, therefore, must um, speak to the bishops who hide behind the statement, women don't want women pastors. It must speak to the pastors who say, my church isn't ready for women preachers yet. It must, te it must teach the seminarians who feel that women have no place in seminary. Uh, it must teach the um, it must address the women in the church and community who are content and complacent with their oppression. It must challenge the educators who would re-educate the people only um, on, on every issue except the issue of the dignity and equality of women. Does it sound familiar, you all? Did you all 
uh, know that uh, these issues were what we were dealing with back, you know, just a few decades ago. Uh, such a theology, black theology, uh, will look at or, or, or challenging black theology to be more inclusive. Such a theology will look at the meaning of the total Jesus Christ event. It will consider not only how God through Jesus Christ is related to the oppressed men, but to women as well. Such a theology will allow God through the Holy Spirit to work through persons without regard to race, sex, or class. This theology will exercise its prophetic function and serve as a self-test in the church characterized by the sins of racism, sexism, and other forms of oppression. Um, and uh, I uh, continue there in challenging the, um, uh, the um, uh, Black theology uh, because it was not sufficient enough to include the challenges uh, that women, Black women were facing. Uh, black theology was um, focused on um, back there in 1979, uh, focused on uh, racism and um, only um, racism. And you see that uh, in, um, in the work of, uh, of, of James Cone. Um, he indeed was, um, uh, was at that time not able to um, open up his analysis to include fully uh, the experiences of African American women. Um, and so if you go back and look at um, his first uh, books, uh, the first four uh, books, he was really basically setting the stage uh, for uh, his radical challenging of racism in the church and in the society, both nationally and globally. Clear analysis of church, of the church's history of racism as practice in the church itself and in the larger society uh, is what he was dealing with. Foundational to these racist practices are the racist theologies produced by theologians of the white church. He was the first to provide us with a systematic challenge of racism in Christian theology. Now we have on record critics such as David Walker, historical critics, David Walker, um, Richard Allen, Denmark VC, Nat Turner, Henry McNeil Turner and others. Uh, who did their critiques as well. Cone, using these persons and other aspects of African-American history and experience, developed Black theology as a discipline. And in this discipline, he clearly liberates Christian theology from the clutches of white supremacists ideologies, ideologues, by declaring in that um, third book that Christian theology is a theology of liberation. It is a rational study of the being of God in the world in light of the existential situation of an oppressed community relating the forces of liberation to the essence of the gospel, which is Jesus Christ. This is Cone's Black Theology of Liberation, and it came from uh, the third book, uh, A Black Theology of uh, Liberation. Well, uh, do we see anything about gender? 
uh, in these uh, in these volumes? Well, I was Cohn's first female PhD student at Union Theological Seminary. It was in his class on black theology, interestingly, that I was introduced to feminist theology, yeah. um, which led to my work in black feminist theology, of course, later renamed feminist uh, womanist theology, <clears throat> adopting the term most immediately from the work of Alice Walker and stemming from the experiences of many African-American women historically. Um, and I'll say some more about this later, um, yeah, if we have uh, uh, some time. Black women in the MDiv program at Union organized Union's first Black Women's Caucus, and they began to challenge the sexism of Black men primarily in the seminary initially. Uh, Cone then was hearing the issues uh, that I was raising in his classes, and at the same time, those um, being raised uh, in the Black Women's Caucus. Uh, and incidentally, he also writes, uh, when he did get to the point of um, addressing some of these issues, he did also say that, um, uh, of course, being at Union, he was also uh, hearing what feminists uh, in that context were um, saying as well. His consciousness clearly was being raised. We black women seminarians invited him to speak at a seminar um, on black women in ministry. There he challenged the brother seminarians for their sexism. Uh, later black women seminarians meeting at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary invited him to speak on the uh, on the, on the same subject. Um, uh, there again, uh, in the essay, uh, in this essay, uh, Black Women in Ministry, a Theological Appraisal, um, Cone challenged uh, not only uh, Black male seminarians, but he also challenged uh, Black males in the church. Mm, now, I said that this was, um, uh, this essay was done at Union first and then at Garrett. Um, actually, I think it may have been the other way around. I think he did it at Garrett first. Uh, and then we asked him to um, do it at uh, Union as well to address some of the issues uh, that were uh, going on uh, on campus um, at uh, Union Theological Seminary, those issues that we were experiencing uh, as, uh, as, as seminarians. Um, uh, issues that reflected, um, um, I, I remember one student telling me, um, uh, you talk too much in class, you shouldn't be talking so much, um, and which surprised me because I've always been a very quiet person. You know, I'm more on the shy side um, and very quiet. So I was shocked when he said that to me. And then the other student, another male student was um, a little more um, descriptive. He said, you don't belong in my classroom, you belong in my kitchen and in my bedroom. Um, uh, now these there, I, I would you know say back then that these men are somewhere pastoring somebody's churches um, uh, with these uh, with these uh, attitudes. Uh, but um, anyway, these were the issues that we were dealing with in seminary, and Cone was um, being um, made aware of uh, these issues. He was listening. Uh, to what um, women were saying, and um, of course, taking uh, taking all this in. Well, this is um, you know to the seventies, and in the eighties, the mid eighties uh, is when we um, uh, adopted the term um, um, womanist. Uh, and I'm not keeping track of the time. Um, uh, I'm okay. Okay. Um, okay. So in the, in the mid eighties is when then we. Um, um, transition from using the term black feminism, uh, even though I'm gonna uh, use the term some more um, um, if, if I have some time, uh, and began using uh, the word um, uh, womanist um, 
you know, some use the word, use the term black womanist as uh, Katie uh, Cannon did at one point. Dolores Williams used the term black womanist slash or dash feminist, black womanist dash feminist. Um, but uh, they were all changed to, you know, just uh, womanist. Um, and as I indicated earlier, uh, we um, um, adopted that term from uh, Alice Walker. I'm not going to get into that because I'm sure uh, you are aware of um, her definitions of, uh, of that word, her uh, I think six or seven part definitions uh, of that word. Uh, but it was 1985 that Katie Cannon um, wrote an essay called The uh, Emergence of Black Feminist Consciousness, uh, published in Letty Russell's book, um, Feminist Interpretations of the Bible, uh, 1986, uh, that um, my article, Women's Theology, uh, Black Women's Experiences as a Source for Doing Theology, with a special reference to Christology, published in the ITC Journal. And in 1987, uh, Dolores Williams uh, published the uh, essay, Womanist Theology, Black Women's Voices, uh, and that was published in um, uh, Christianity and um, Crisis. Um, uh, and, and of course, this is what was going on in at Union uh, Theological Seminary in New York um, uh, with, um, you know, the, the, the three of us, um, uh, Katie, uh, uh, Dolores, and myself. Um, but of course, women, uh, women, women, black women were, were, were beginning to to do to do um, uh, to do become uh, uh, vocal and, and to do their own uh, interpretation and reinterpretation. Renita Williams at Princeton Theological Seminary um, in uh, 1987. I'm forgetting the name of the, uh, her her book, um, it, uh, but it, it it'll come to me. But it was published in 1987, uh, and um, women um, began to um, talk about the limitations of, of Black theology um, in a variety uh, of uh, places. And uh, many of them focused on James Cone. Why? Because he was a father of, uh, considered to be the father of, um, of um, Black theology. But of course, there were other Black theologians as well uh, that were being challenged. They were challenged for their exclusionary uh, methodology, methodology and for their limited understanding of liberation. Uh, when the theologians and ethicists uh, continued in their challenging and constructive theological uh, developments. Dolores Williams, uh, uh, in particular, challenged one of the basic biblical events uh, serving as a basis uh, of not only uh, Cone's theology, but liberation theology in general. Uh, that is the Exodus um, experience. Uh, liberation theologians uh, managed to keep um, patriarchy uh, as the ground of, uh, of its system. Um, however, Williams was able to re-image the Exodus experience, focusing on the wilderness uh, and bringing forth Hagar as a central point of, of the story. Here, we are able to see the leadership roles of Black mothers um, uh, and women. Um, Alan Bozak, a uh, South African um, theologian, provides a good discussion of Black women, uh, womanist reinterpretation of uh, uh, the narratives um, in um, uh, one of his uh, um, works uh, where he focuses on uh, how Black women uh, began to challenge the patriarchy uh, that still existed in the works of liberation theologians, um, not only in um, the United the U.S. but also South Africa, uh, South Af South African liberation uh, uh, theology. He was a South African uh, uh, theologian. He focused on the works of other Black women, such as Cheryl Kirk Dugan and uh, Cheryl Townsend Jilts um, and others, and how they challenge. Um, uh, the comfort of um, Black uh, theology, Black theologians with patriarchy, uh, with the patriarchy of the Exodus um, experience. Um, well, the interesting thing uh, is, uh, is um, you know, um, 
we can see, you know, how Cone was being impacted by uh, what women were doing, what women were saying, not only, you know, the students um, that he was teaching, uh, students that he was uh, mentoring, PhD candidates, and also the MDiv and MA students that he was uh, teaching. And so, of course, I mean, he, he was, his work was being impacted in very significant and uh, positive ways. Um, uh, so um, he began to, and this, and this was reflected um, in, his, um, in his theology. I mentioned already the paper that he did um, uh, at Garrett uh, and also at, um, uh, at uh, Union, we asked him to do it at Union. Let me just read a, a little section uh, that he um, that he used to challenge um, uh, the students. Um, many black women contended that their silence on sexism did not mean that it was absent in the black community, but only that they did not wish to divide black men and women in the struggle against racism. Black women's silence began to end at Union and other places because Black men misused their silence by refusing to even consider that sexism was a real problem in the Black community. Black men continued to claim that Black women have always been free. <laughs> As I listened to Black women articulate their pain, and as I observed the insensitive responses of Black men, it became existentially clear to me that sexism was a Black problem too. Sexism was a Black problem too. Uh, he said uh, a lot more uh, um, regarding that in that in that essay, uh, but of course, even after that, in 1976, um, you know the beat the beat goes on, and um, uh, Cone continued to develop uh, in his uh, challenging of um, sexism, challenging even especially of the brothers, um, and not only was this being taken seriously in the United States, but it was also being taken seriously um, in other places of the world. Um, and, um, um, and, and I have a, a couple of examples from um, South African women uh, theologians who began to challenge uh, black liberation theology uh, in South Africa as developed in South Africa. And guess what? Uh, they were using James Cone's words uh, as um, as um, uh, ways of challenging what was going on in um, uh, black theology in uh, in South uh, black black liberation theology uh, in South Africa. Uh, and here's what uh, uh, one author uh, says um, in 1985. Cone raised a powerful concern when he met with South African Black theologians, such as Alan Bosak, Takatso Mofoking, uh, Masala, and others. His main concern was gender and sexuality in Black theology of liberation and the Black church, as he felt that it was avoided. Cone in my and uh, in my Mela and Hopkins, a book published in 1989, stated clearly that if Black theology and the Black church want to talk about inclusive liberation, they could not take gender and sexuality lightly in their struggle for liberation in South Africa and even in the United States of America. Cohn acknowledges the works of uh, Roxanne, uh, Roxanne uh, Jordan and Kelly Brown, 
who wrote about gender and sexuality, as well as many other Black women who made a clear point coming from uh, South Africa and the United States of America. After acknowledging other works, Cone admits his and other Black theologians' failure to address gender and sexuality as they have addressed white supremacy and class discrepancy. And he says, it is not easy for us men to face it honestly, seriously, and with the integrity that it needs. Nevertheless, wholeness in sexuality involves more than just the relation between men and women. In addition, it involves the relation between women and women and men and men as gays and lesbians are teaching us, unquote. Um, you, you, you see, uh, uh, Cone uh, is growing in his, um, uh, and uh, correcting some of the mistakes uh, that he made in his early, in his early works. He is able to um, admit his uh, mistakes. He is able to admit uh, the fact that he uh, was not inclusive and he had the capacity to go forth and to challenge uh, brothers in the church uh, for the fact that they continue to be exclusive um, and continue to keep uh, women um, silent. Um, now he continues this, um, you know, after that fourth volume, actually you will find in all of the volumes since that, um, uh, since his fourth um, volume, that he addressed issues of gender uh, and, and he addressed issues of, of class and sexuality and, and other issues uh, that um, uh, that um, women are dealing with. Um, in both Black theology and the Black church, uh, Black feminist theology offers a radical challenge uh, to the accepted Black male ways of saying and doing things. Black feminists insist that our language about God, which refers to the divine in inclusive exclusive male language must change in order to reflect the image of God in black women. The same is true for our language about man. To think of God and humanity in exclusive male terms, i.e. God as he and man as male and female, reflects a patriarchal tradition that denies the full humanity of women. Masculine language in religion and theology serves as theological justification for the subordination of women in the church and society. In rejecting the patriarchal language of black religion, black women seem to be agreeing with white feminist theologians who have made the same point in the theology of white males. In secular society and the church, black feminists have challenged black males' easy acceptance of white males' definition of the place of the woman. Uh, this statement uh, comes from uh, his book, My Soul, My Soul uh, Looks Back. Uh, my soul looks back. Um, he continues. Um, some black men claim that there is no oppression of women in the black church. Such a statement sounds like white people saying that there is no racism in the white church. As a black male theologian, I know that the black woman's experience is not adequately reflected in black theology. 
most of us have not even thought about the unique suffering of Black women. We have not allowed ourselves to be taught by Black women so that our theological reflection can more adequately reflect the whole Black community. If Black women represent nearly 75% of the Black church membership, does it not follow that the same percentage should be uh, present in the leadership of the church? Uh, this was... Uh, written in 1986. Now, we, we do know that there have been some improvement uh, in terms of the leadership of um, uh, Black women in the church. Uh, but um, we also know that the problem has not been um, uh, resolved. Uh, it still exists um, uh, among us. Um, he also talks about the um, uh, the way uh, or ways that um, even our beloved leaders, Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, uh, were not able to see the problem of um, of women. Um, I, I'm not going to uh, read these sections, but um, uh, actually, the the point he makes about Martin Luther King is that he really King really was not able to uh, to see. Uh, the gender issue, um, he was not able to um, uh, see that uh, women, Black women, Black women's presence in the civil rights movement uh, needed to be acknowledged in more significant ways. Um, um, uh, and so uh, uh, presented a problem in terms of uh, even though women were so overwhelmingly in support of the civil rights movement, um, the civil rights movement was not necessarily overwhelmingly in support of, of women. One of, the, one of the examples that he used he uses is that um, uh, in describing one of the meetings of uh, a major meeting of the leadership of uh, the civil rights um, group, uh, all of the participants who were male. Uh, their names were were listed. Um, their names were given, but for the women, uh, it states simply that there were seven women um, uh, participants. Even though there were more women, uh, there were about five men. Uh, they listed the names of all the men, but with regard to the women, uh, they just said that there were five. There were seven women uh, who participated in the meeting. Uh, interestingly, um, he made another point with regard to Malcolm X. Malcolm X, after um, uh, some of his travels in the uh, Middle East, um, he came to another conclusion with regard to, uh, to women. Um, he was very anti-woman as well in terms of um, his traditional understanding of women, uh, but he made um, some movement when he experienced women um, in a different way as he traveled through Africa and uh, Middle East. I'll just read a little, a, a couple of lines of this. One thing that I became aware of in my traveling recently through Africa and Middle East, in every country you go to, usually the degree of progress can never be separated from the women. If you're in a country that's progressive, the women, the woman is progressive. If you're in a country that reflects the consciousness toward the importance of education, it's because the woman is aware of the importance of education. Uh, and so, um, you know, Malcolm, you know, developed a, a little uh, more of a positive uh, understanding of um, uh, women's uh, place uh, in uh, the uh, church and in the uh, society. How's my time looking? Uh, um, okay. Um, well, uh, he, he, he continues in this regard. The point that I'm making simply is that Cohn made an about face. He made an about face. And even though he received a lot of criticism, a lot of challenges for 
um, you know, what he did in his early work uh, that is um, uh, brought into uh, uh, patriarchal structures, uh, even as he challenged um, racism, um, uh, the point was that he was able to um, make an about face and to uh, do something uh, a little different. Um, in, in his work for my people, um, you know, he has a chapter where he talks about black theology, black church and the black woman. And he uh, makes some very key points with regard to women's presence uh, in the church. In some black churches, women are still excluded entirely from the ordained ministry, but even in the churches where uh, that do ordain women, female ministers do not have the same opportunities as men um, uh, in the exercising of this uh, of their ministry. This is written in, in 92. Um, and uh, there have been some changes, but um, not a whole lot of changes. Uh, one could say uh, that the, the same thing uh, uh, remains. Um, and one key point he makes here is only black women can do black feminist theology. Their experience is truly theirs. Therefore, even if white feminists were not so racist and black men were not so sexist, there would still be a need for black feminist theology. The need arises from the uniqueness of black women's experience. If theology arises out of the attempt to reconcile faith with life, and if Black women have an experience of faith in God that is not exhausted by white women or Black men, then there is a need to articulate the faith of Black women so that the universal church can learn from their experience with God. Um, that's really what he was saying to me when he told me in that meeting uh, in Atlanta, we don't need another Jim Cohn. I'm bringing you to Union Theological Seminary to study theology so that you can do theology from your own perspective, so that you can look at your experience and, um, and do theology from the perspective of Black women. Why? Because I can't do it. I'm not a Black woman. Um, now, there are other resources that talk about um, the fact that the you know the other South African women who um, who were able to use Cone's work, you know, as he made his transition and began to speak for, uh, in the interest of black women being black women being empowered to do their own theology. I I listed some um, some um, some quotes from. Uh, some of his books, but in all of his books, as I indicated since that first um, four books, in all of the books, then he deals uh, with these issues of um, of um, gender contradiction and and um, class contradiction and later contradiction with regard to sexuality and and other issues as well. Let me just conclude with one with one story um, that uh, represents. Um, you know his 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 perspective that you know he cannot do uh, uh, womanist theology. Black women must do womanist theology and speak out of uh, the experiences of black women. He can't do it. So what did he do? What he did was that he put then black women into positions. Um, where they would be able, we would be able to do the kind of theology that Black women need to do. He do this, did this in several ways. One is that he brought in Black women as PhD students, and um, not only Black women, but Native American women, Asian American women, um, 
um, to to teach and to teach how to do theology from their own experiences. But uh, two things he did um, early on in my studies with him. One is uh, that he um, made sure that I became a member of ETWAT, which stands for the Ecumenical Association of Third World Theologians, uh, where we met with theologians all over the world, third world theologians all over the world. Uh, and it was in that context uh, that um, uh, we were able to make some significant impact with regard to women's realities. Um, and it was in 1983 uh, that we developed the Women's Commission, the Women's Division of the Ecumenical Association of Third World Theologians. Just before we got started, uh, Dr. Kelly um, uh, Brown Douglas and I were talking about our experiences in Oaxtepec, uh, uh, Mexico, because uh, Jim Cohn also brought um, Dr. Kelly. Uh, into the uh, process uh, as well. And so we both uh, at the meeting in Mexico and we were also at the women's meeting in um, in Costa Rica uh, as well. Uh, but the other thing Dr. Cohen did when uh, I first came to um, Union Theological Seminary, he was a member of the position paper committee of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, and after uh, the first meeting of that group, um, he uh, made sure uh, that they brought me into that process. And so I became a member of that position paper uh, committee, a committee uh, in the AME church uh, that was led by uh, three or four bishops, Bishop Adams, John Hurst Adams, Bishop um, Brookins, H.H. Uh, Brookins, uh, Bishop Anderson, um, Vinton Anderson, um, Bishop Talbot, I'm, I'm, I may miss you one. Uh, and, and Dr. Cohn and some other uh, leaders in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. We were tasked uh, to write, um, the Amy Church had not taken positions on current issues of the day. And so we were tasked with writing papers uh, on different issues, capital punishment, issues of uh, abortion uh, back then, homosexuality is what, was, what it was called. We, we weren't uh, LGBTQIA back then, we were just homosexuality. Uh, back then, position papers on social justice um, uh, and on women. And of course, I, as um, you know, he uh, expected would do, I did the paper on women. Uh, and I did a paper, and uh, these papers were presented to the General Conference of 1976, which is held here in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and in that position paper, I called for the um, for the um, acceptance of women's ordination and for the participation of women at all levels of the church, from leadership as pastors to mid mid judicatories, presiding elders, et cetera, to bishop and general officers of, of the church. And at that general conference, I also called together women in ministry um, who were attending the conference, but of course, women were not delegates. There were just uh, lay women were delegates, but not women in ministry. There, I was told that there were two women in ministry who were delegates uh, at this general conference. So I called together the women ministry, to make a long story short, that led to the organizing of the AA Women in Ministry. Um, and it led to our being um, uh, made uh, an official organ, uh, organization of the church. Uh, and it, it uh, resulted in our uh, having been given a commission, uh, which meant that we were indeed uh, an official part of the church. Uh, led to the election of women as um, general officers of the church uh, and um, the uh, first uh, election of the first bishop uh, in the Amy Church in the year 2000, Vashtar McKenzie. And then in 2004, we elected um, uh, other bishops um, uh, of the church, Carolyn uh, Tyler Guidry, Francis uh, Davis, and then 2012, uh, the election of... Um, of um, uh, of Henning and Henning Byfield, uh, and then uh, the the latest um, to be elected was um, Bishop Franc uh, uh, Bishop Francine Brookins. Uh, so the point that I'm making is, um, you know, I guess somebody would have done it, but it was James Cone who, in the mid '70s, appointed me, saw to it that I was on this committee. Uh, that um, enabled me to 
uh, do what I was able to do in this committee that led to the development of, of the organization, Amy Wynn Ministry, which led, whose advocacy led to the um, greater participation of women at various levels of the church. Now, even though there has been significant um, progress and improvement, you know, liberation is still not a reality for Black women, even though there has been significant um, progress uh, in the church uh, and in the larger society. Uh, but the point that I'm making is um, we can see from the anti-sexism work that James Cone did that there has been a significant, um, a significant, there has been significant progress uh, in terms of women's reality, uh, both in the church and in the large society, uh, because of the work of this man who told me at lunch one day that we don't need another Jim Cone. But what we need is a Jackie Grant and a Kelly Brown Douglas and a Diane Stewart and uh, the other black women and Asian American women and Native American women and women of color to do their own theologies. In other words, the anti-sexism work of James Cone empowered women of color. Thank you so much. Dr. Jackie Grant, thank you so much for that lecture and taking us not simply through a historical journey of Dr. James Cone's movement from a black theology that seemed all too masculinist and male-centered to an understanding of what it meant to be critiqued by his own theology to so therefore beginning and opening up uh, his theological paradigm so that it too would be a critique, not simply of racism, but of sexism and patriarchy. But it was more your lecture provided with us more than this journey from of James Cone's learning, but it also helped us to understand that anti-sexism work is not simply the work that we do through our theological words, but it really is about opening up pathways for other persons, those persons who have been denied access, uh, whether it is to theological education or beyond, but opening up pathways for those persons to claim their voice. And as James Cone said to you, he said to all of his students, and he certainly said to me over and over again, uh, Kelly, find your own voice. He would tell me again, as he told you, there does not need to be another James Cone. So Dr. Jacqueline Grant, I thank you uh, for that lecture and showing us all through the work of James Cone, the possibilities for growing and what it means to truly live in to the words that one indeed says. Uh, and as he has opened up pathways, and in so many ways, uh, is the root of the tree, if you will, for a lot of womanist religious scholars. Now we will have an opportunity to engage those of you who have been listening in, we'll have an opportunity to engage with Dr. Grant and to ask her questions. I will remind you to place your questions in the Zoom chat. Leading us in this question and answer session tonight is my good colleague, the assistant professor of homiletics and the director of the Religion and Black Experience Concentration, Reverend Dr. Timothy Levi Atkins Jones 
who is also the pastor of the historic Bethany Baptist Church in Newark, New Jersey. I will now turn this part of our evening over to Dr. Jones, Atkins Jones. Dean Douglas, thank you so much uh, for that uh, introduction. And indeed, it is such an honor uh, to be here and to have experienced an incredible lecture. Uh, Dr. Grant, thank you for uh, sharing with us uh, this evening. Uh, there are folk that are pouring in uh, questions, and uh, and so I'm going to try to to get through as many as we can. But I'll take a bit of of moderator privilege, if you, if you will, and ask uh, my own question first, if that's all right. Um, I think that in in sort of popular descriptions of the sort of birth of womanist theology, many would have have said colloquially, at least that it was a kind of response to black liberation theology. It was, or it was a response to a certain lack in uh, what existed in black liberation theology. But as I heard you speaking this evening, um, in some ways, yes, it was a response to what didn't exist, but you also uh, crafted out a narrative that suggested that Dr. Cohn uh, wanted to and recognized those holes and really spurred on uh, the birth of, of Black feminist and, and womanist theology. Would you say that's a sort of accurate assessment of, of how uh, you would narrate its development? Um, yeah, I mean, it has to do with um, the um, methodology for doing theology, um, you know, um, and, 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 and what are your, your sources uh, for doing theology? Um, even Cohn, as he listed his sources, uh, yeah, uh, black experience, um, uh, the Bible, um, tradition, uh, church history, et cetera. Uh, those are sources um, for doing uh, theology. But the question is, you know, uh, we need to know how um, different people, groups of people use those sources. Uh, you know, um, when we talk about black experiences, we, we, we need to talk about what black experience, uh, black women experiences, black males experiences, um, uh, so we need to be able to articulate our own uh, experiences. So um, it, 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 uh, it, there's a sense in which, uh, you know, we can say that he really couldn't do or say anything else other than that. I mean, I can understand. I, I, I don't, you know, um, fault him a whole lot. I mean, I, I, I critiqued them in my article in seventy in seventy nine. Sure. You, you know, so that we can we can understand, you, you know, that there is something missing there. Uh, that we need to develop, you know, that I need to develop, uh, and other folks who are not black male theologians uh, uh, need to uh, develop. But I mean, there's a sense in which, you know, I mean, he was challenging. He got out of seminary, and you know, I um, mean, talked about the, you know the fact that um, you know there was some white um, white professor wouldn't even shake his hand, wouldn't mm. even congratulate him for. Because uh, he had the audacity to graduate um, uh, from this white um, uh, institution, um, and um, you know he had the wherewithal and 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 the insight to um, challenge sure. you know what uh, he learned, what he experienced uh, there and other and other places of uh, of of white um, of the white church and white theological uh, arenas, sure. uh, and so I mean that was a phenomenal task. Uh, that in fact uh, uh, he he did and and he um, did that um, you know consistently uh, in that book. But you know you can't answer all of the questions um, you know in any um, you know one in, you know one or two or three even or four sure. uh, you know sources or resources um, that takes development uh, over time. And then uh, you also acknowledge and recognize that there are some questions that you may not be able to answer. Um, but you may be able to point in the direction uh, of the answers. And that, that's what he recognized that he, I mean, he knew that he could not do uh, theology from the perspective of women, um, you, you know, and so he, he did put women in place uh, in strategic places where they are in fact able uh, to express theological, theologically from their own um, from their own uh, experiences, and so um, um, you know, um, I, I I commend him for what he did do, and I I also um, uh, appreciate the fact that he did uh, he did begin to address the issues in ways that um, uh, that he that he could. 
Um, now, even in the end, I mean, she recognized that he uh, he admitted that he still may not have done enough. Uh, perhaps he could have uh, could have should have done more sure. uh, than he uh, did. But he did a whole lot more than a whole lot of other um, <laughs> uh, black males uh, did. So, um, uh, so um, you know, I I think um, he was um, able to use his position. Um, to enable the empowerment of others. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we have quite a few questions to come through, so I think I'm going to try to try to see if I can um, pick some uh, that represent the sample of them. One is uh, very specific. In, in your lecture, uh, you spoke quite a bit about the sort of global issues and global issues of Blackness and, uh, the, and interacting with uh, theologians uh, across the world. So this one question comes, uh, Black women in Brazil represent almost 25% of the population of Brazil. However, domestic violence and femicide against Black women have increased absurdly in recent years. Theologically, what advice can you give for this Brazilian reality? Oh, yeah. I had the opportunity to meet with um, a group of Brazilian women. Uh, it's been a while uh, now. It's been um, quite a few years um, uh, that I uh, met with them. Um, and of course, they they were um, they were um, talking about uh, issues that um, some of the uh, same issues that um, that we in womanist and uh, women's um, uh, sphere deal with uh, here, um, and that indeed is inclusive of. Um, of um, domestic violence and subordination, subordination of women in a variety of ways. Interestingly, in that meeting um, with, with this group of women, as they were talking, telling uh, their stories, I don't remember the, ex the expression. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I was smiling or, or what, or shaking my head a lot um, uh, as, they, as they were talking about their experiences. Uh, and then when they finished, they went went around the room, you know, telling their their various stories. And when I finally got an opportunity to respond, um, I, I chuckled a little bit and I said, "We're we're we have the same story. Mm. We have the same story. The, yeah. the 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 same issues of women's subordination, same issues of women's oppression, uh, same issues um, of violence um, in the family." Uh, and even outside of the family, um, same issues of um, uh, disrespect for women's bodies. Um, uh, you know, so you know, my 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 um, counsel uh, would be, you know, continue to bring the issues forth um, and continue to um, struggle against them. Uh, you know, I. I uh, often say that one of my mantras is the more things change, the more things remain the same. Mm. You know, um, you know, this is several years ago that that we talked about that in that little small group. Um, and here we are, you know, still the issues are still the same, you know. Um, so um, we just need to continue to struggle. We need to continue to identify the issues. Right. We need to continue to talk, to talk about the issues. We can't let them, we can't have folks to sweep them under the rug. Uh, we need to continue to, um, you know, make sure that we put them in places where these issues uh, can be deal with, uh, dealt with in um, in effective ways. I mean, it's not an it's not um, an easy um, uh, process, um, but we do uh, need and continue and continue to um, train uh, women uh, in these um, various a areas. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a question here about uh, the Bible. Um, and so what advice would you give to women Christian theologians grappling with the patriarchal nature of the biblical text itself? And then uh, she offers a few uh, different examples like uh, the New Testament pitting Hagar and Sarah against one another, uh, et cetera. So how, how do we wrestle with this text that means so much to many? Um, yeah, well, um be in dialogue uh, with uh, women um, uh, whose who's, um, who's specialty, you know, I mentioned um, uh, Renita Weems, um, 
Uh, and uh, there are other biblical scholars uh, these days, Renita Weems being the, uh, the first one, uh, PhD in, in uh, biblical studies. Um, uh, so, and we have uh, more uh, these days, women who are beginning, uh, who have begun. I mean, this, this is 2023. Uh, so we, we've, we've had, um, you know, women who have come on the scene and, and are uh, ena enabling us um, uh, to do different kinds of biblical interpretation. Um, so, you know, still, again, I say we just need to continue to be, um, to produce these women and to continue to empower them to do the kinds of re-imaging and reinterpreting that in fact, um, um, black women and women of color uh, need to, um, to operate effectively uh, in the church and outside the church in the larger society as well. So um, uh, yeah, we just need to produce more. Amen, keep writing. Uh, so there are a couple of questions, a couple of people have asked different versions of this question. Uh, in your lecture, you spoke about uh, womanism uh, and black feminism almost as synonymous, not quite. Uh, but a couple of folk have noted that in current scholarship, uh, there seems to be a very sort of clear distinction between black feminists and womanists. And so they're asking, uh, how might you comment on the distinctives between womanism and black feminism? Um, there, there are some who, um, you know, have not, have not, um, been um, desirous, desirous of moving to the womanist um, um, uh, label. Um, you, you know, there are those who would argue that, um, you know, at least uh, when you talk about black um, issue, there, there is a system of, of analysis um, that we can speak of when we talk about black analysis, feminist analysis, uh, there is a system of which we can speak. Uh, when we talk about feminist uh, feminist now, so we talk about black um, uh, feminism. Um, we, we, you know, uh, that worked for uh, for me and for uh, for others um, uh, in order to define the kind of find the label for us when we first started doing uh, uh, this work uh, in the latter part of the seventies. That's what um, that's what I used because that's what was. Uh, was there, That's but there were those of us who were just not sufficiently comfortable uh, with, um, uh, you know, with black feminism, you know, black being, in, you know, an adjective, um, black feminism, and feminism being a noun, uh, or maybe, maybe you were able to define it in ways that black feminist is the word, and so that there's no, um, you know, major noun, and then the ad being adjectized. Um, um, but for, for some of us, the, the, the name change was just, was just a relief. Sure. Uh, it was a, a, a significant for us. Um, we, we, we were, we were not comfortable with what we were calling ourselves at that point. And so the womanist uh, term just provided, um, um, a, a real name for us. I don't have any problems with any one who prefers to sure. continue with um, black feminism, um, um, you know, even uh, some of the um, um, uh, the works that I was um, uh, well, I guess I, I'm not sure I read those uh, those particular ones uh, where Cohn was still referring to us as black feminism, mm -hmm. uh, even at, at the point where we were just switching from black feminism to um, uh, to womanism. Um, but so I don't have any problem with it, but uh, for me and for many, uh, the womanist uh, term just provided an opportunity for us to have our own name. Uh, and so, um, but I have no problem with those who uh, feel more comfortable uh, with the term um, Black feminism. Sure. It seems to be a matter of sources, and I appreciate that even in your uh, earlier answer about where it's coming from. And so as a practical theologian, for me, uh, it is the practice that is the source of so much information and inquiry. Uh, and there are a couple of questions about how to put womanism uh, in practice in churches such that it might uh, lead to the change that we want to see in the churches themselves. 
Uh, and then also that kind of how that change translates to the world. So what advice might you offer for those who are looking for ways to put womanism into practice? Do it. <laughs> just uh, just do it um, and and do that in, in, in a variety uh, of ways so that, you know, one of the, the things that um, you know, one of the, one of the the, uh, the points that I, I I did not make was that um, in my seminary uh, training, I actually um, went to seminary my very first year uh, with the intention of studying um, Christian education, mm -hmm. um, uh, because this was uh, at the height of the Black Power uh, Civil Rights Movement. Uh, where the question was for relevancy um, and in the various schools, universities, et cetera, um, you know, black studies programs are being developed mm -hmm. um, uh, across the country. Um, and, um, you know, I just kind of felt that there need, that needed to take place in the church as well. You, you know, black, uh, um, black studies um, um, uh, uh, programs uh, uh, in, in, in the church and, you know, as a teaching instrument um and um but when i you know got to seminary um and started um studying my first year i mean it was, it was clear to me that um christian education was really not the problem mm. um but christian education was it was a symptom of the problem mm. um you know if you got um and, and what i surmised then was that if you got um uh, bad theology you're gonna have bad christian education program um you got irrelevant theology you're gonna have irrelevant christian education <laughs> right um uh, material if you got white theology you're gonna have white, white christian education uh material so that's when i made my switch from christian education to theology because i wanted to deal with the foundational mm -hmm. issues i wanted to deal with the basic um ground uh of um of uh of the issues uh and so that's what um you, you know made me make my switch uh, to uh, to theology, and you know, it, it's it's my view that it's that foundation, that theological foundation, uh, that enables you to do good Christian education, that enables you to do a different kind of preaching, right? You know, uh, that enables you to do a different kind of counseling, right? Uh, you know, so it's that basic foundation that uh, that, that that that's womanist uh, that should guide you as you do your ministry. Um, uh, in the church, um, it, it should guide you as you're doing all of what it what it what it means to be in the practice uh, of uh, of ministry. So whatever it is, your, whatever is your calling, whatever is your call in terms of the of the specific um, um, practice of um, ministry, uh, then you need to be able to do that uh, informed by some good, uh, I think, relevant womanist uh, uh, theology. Yeah, you need to read more and then put it into practice. I think we have, uh, I think I have time for one question. I'm um, we'll gonna go off of uh, notes for this one. Uh, in the shadow of still uh, of the empty tomb, just a couple of days away from uh, past Easter. Um, I can't help but think about something you said just a few moments ago. And that is the notion that the more things change, uh, the more things stay the same. Uh, and even throughout your lecture, you would um, make reference to points of progress, but also know how there's still such a long way to go. Um, and so in also thinking about uh, Dean Douglas's recent books, uh, Resurrection Hope, uh, I wanna ask you, how do you continue to, and how might we continue to maintain hope for progress and for liberation in light of uh, what seems to be a slowly progressing uh, movement forward? Gotta do it. <laughs> You gotta, you gotta just do it. More things change and more things remain the same. That means the challenge is always there. Right. The challenge is consistently, is consistently there. The other one, the other one, the other mantra I use is we've come a long way. Mm -hmm. Oh, we got a long way to go. Right. Uh, in fact, I usually, we, got, we have a longer, longer way to go. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so, um, you know, just keep uh, abreast of what the woman has done re-imaging is, what the women's reinterpretations are, what the women's challenges are, um, and keep that before you. 
uh, and um, and keep at it. Right. I keep doing it. Okay. Oh, we do, we do have time for one more. Uh, let's see. Well, actually, we did that one. Um, I guess it's a question of what does if if we're moving towards liberation. Uh, what does the political political economy look like in a more liberated future? Um, things change. The, the, the problem, you know, I do, you know, I, I I know sounds like you know, um, you, you know, I'm acting like everything is so easy. No, no. Um, uh, but you see, the problem with liberation is that it changes things mm. it changes us um and um things in a real liberty if you're coming out of an oppressed society and you know moving toward liberation things are going to change yeah. you know the things you used to do you may not be able to do no more <laughs> um the things you used to have you may not have anymore right um, you know, so uh, so so things so things do um, change. What oppressors, you know, had in the past, they may not have anymore. Mm. You know, because you've got to give up something. Liberation requires that you've got to give up uh, something. Uh, and so, um, if you got to give up, if you are an oppressor, you know, in an, in, in the gender issue, you know, men have got to give up something in the race issue, white folks got to give up something, you know, that's one of the reasons why uh, I think, um, you, you know, I guess the, the most recently, uh, you know, apartheid you know, took so, it just took so a while to kind of dismantle, you know, because I mean, white folks were, you know, afraid that, um, you know, black folks were going to do to them what they did to, mm. what they were doing to um, black folks. Well, it's the yeah. same thing is, is true here in this, in this context, you know, yeah. um, you know, historically. Um, you know that's just that's just a part of what what happens um, uh, when you try to dismantle um, you know different kinds of oppressive systems. Um, people um, are not always clear on what they're going to have to give up. Yeah. Um, but for liberation to become the model, uh, then that means you know you know as poor folks move up, you know as women move up, as black folks move up, then you know, rich folks gonna have to have to, you know, come uh, down. White folks gonna have to come down. Men gonna have to, you, there's gonna have to be some some um, some giving up right. of something uh, in order that liberation become a, a a reality. That's why we keep fighting, right? Because the powers they don't want to give it up, <laughs> and I don't want to uh, give up this time, Doctor Grant. I have to, though, but it's been such a joy uh, to be with you, both in your lecture and this time in q &A. Thank you so much uh, for welcoming us in, uh, but also for accepting this invitation. You've been a great gift uh, and blessing to us. And I'm going to turn it back over to, to Dean Douglas. No, I will just join you, Dr. Atkins-Jones, in thanking you, uh, Dr. Jacqueline Grant, for this lecture and this time to reflect upon not only the work of Dr. Cohn, but the way in which that work continues to challenge us and the way in which we continue to be challenged to open up spaces uh, for women and for others who have been uh, marginalized in the academy and society and in the church. And so on behalf of uh, Dr. Uh, Serene Jones and myself and all who have joined us, thank you for an evening in which we have all been inspired and all been challenged. And thank you for being our third annual, our third speaker in our annual James Cone Lecture Series. And thank you all for joining us on this evening. <laughs>